Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Christopher Burrell. I teach history uh, at HOSOS, and I'm also currently uh, the liaison uh, to the Ed Tech Education Technology Department and coordinator of the HOSOS Online Learning Assessment, uh, or OLA, task force. Um, OLA began in, oops, where's the next? Okay. Uh, OLA began in uh, the fall of 2015 as an ad hoc group of faculty and education technology staff, um, including the director, Carlos Guevara. Uh, Carlos and EdTet liaison, Professor Kate Lyons of the library department ran the asynchronous and hybrid course development programs at our campus. Um, while these initiatives had been increasingly successful in promoting the development of asynchronous and hybrid courses at the college, they recognized that there was no mechanism currently in place to assess the effectiveness of the courses or students' experiences in those courses after their creation. Learning about faculty and student experiences could potentially shed light on various aspects of the online educational experiences um, for the ed tech department including faculty course development, student experiences with online learning pedagogies, and perhaps college administration budgeting for educational technology and online learning. As Ola began to meet, Carlos and Kate helped us all develop a vision for why our task force would benefit the department, faculty, students, and the college at large while also allowing the direction of, of the OLA task force to be shaped by the committee members. One of the most important things we did from the beginning was to develop a research agenda focused on student perceptions of online learning at OSTOS. The task force for, a better, for the better part of a year uh, researched articles about online learning at community colleges nationally and also researched how online learning was being assessed. Based on that research, task force members worked to develop a questionnaire to assess student perceptions of online learning. My colleague will explain more about the research process that we undertook and what we hope to find out, but suffice to say that publishing our research findings in peer reviewed journals was a very important part of our making our committee sustainable uh, for the long term. We were able to develop, uh, to demonstrate our effectiveness to the college and provide a rationale for the ed tech director to request more resources for his department and ultimately for our committee. Uh, it also, developing a research agenda also helped us maintain enthusiasm and keep up morale for doing the work that we were doing without any extra remuneration or even acknowledgement in the beginning. After a couple of years of consistent meetings and developing research, the committee decided that one way we could solidify our permanence, clarify our goals to ourselves, and articulate our vision for contributing to the college's development was to craft a mission statement. I took the lead on this task, but received valuable input from the entire task force. And so on December 17th, 2017, we agreed to adopt the mission statement that's on the screen. Our early leadership from the ed tech department, the commitment to uh, the commitment of the members to develop and cultivate a research agenda the publication of several journal articles and numerous local and national conference presentations, and the consistent lobbying to our college's administration in annual reports and otherwise have been some of the factors that have led to ho led hostels to invest more funding in OLA and has facilitated our increasing integration into the teaching and learning program at our college. Four years after we began as an ad hoc committee, the OLA task force now has a coordinator that receives three credits of release time each semester, is a member of the ed tech liaisons group that meets bi-weekly to discuss um, the progress of various ed tech initiatives and ways in which each of the programs can be both more integrated and more independent 
as needs arrive. We have gone from fad to forever over the course of our past four years. And so now I'll turn the podium over to my colleague. Hi, everybody. I'm Jackie DeSanto, and I had the privilege of being invited to join OLA. Um, early on in our research, we sat down and asked, what is it that we want to know? What are our concerns? And we focused mostly on students. Well, how are they dealing with online courses? Do they have enough technology? Because the myth was, at least in my department, because we advise students on courses to take, and we always hear from them whenever we say, why, you have a really busy schedule. Did you ever consider an online class? I can't do online. Meanwhile, while you're talking with them, they have their phone out and they're checking on their kids. They may be ordering shoes, ordering food, whatever they're doing. It took a while for us to realize data would help us in advisement. So that's a little personal aside. So as we set our early research agenda, we focused on two things. How well are we preparing students for online instruction. What are we missing? What do they need that we're not giving them? Or are we giving them enough? Are they doing fine? We also wanted to know, what do they bring to the table? What aren't they bringing to the them to the, what aren't they bringing with them to the table? Do they have adequate Wi-Fi access? Do they have a computer or a laptop or some access somewhere that they can designate as my time? Or are they sharing it with every person in the home and they're lucky if they get five minutes at a clip. Or are they doing it at work? Catch as catch can, perhaps between customers. OK. Um, the rationale behind this was we read a lot in, during our research about best practices. And depending on the culture of the college, best practices could have been out of reach for our students, or they might have been behind where our students were. But in order for us to select best practices that we would consider, in our preparation for students and faculty moving into online education, we needed to know what already existed on the campus. We also needed to know that whatever data we uncovered and whatever findings we came up with from the uh, analysis would need to be included in any conversation on improving the preparation of students and faculty for online education. It is appropriate to pay attention to content, delivery, and student perceptions when you are looking at the standards you have set for what needs to take place in your online courses. All right. Why is student perception? Because why are we here? We're here to deliver the best quality education we can, regardless of the venue. We spend a lot of time on all of our campuses working on face-to-face -face classes. There is existing research. There are dozens of specific pedagogical selections that you can make. But how much time do we actually spend saying, what am I going to do in my online class? The person that matters most in your online class is the student. So what they think should be the first thing you consider. These are the kind of questions, and forgive me for reading them. I could never remember them all in this order. Did students know that they were enrolling in an online course? Why were they choosing it? Do they have a specific reason? What kind of access did they have? And how were they completing their assignments? What were their experiences both in asynchronous, totally online courses, and hybrid courses? Did they find the courses to be equally difficult, more difficult, less difficult than face-to-face -face classes? Did they feel comfortable finding things? Things like, where is the content? Where are my assignments? Where are my grades? How do I reach my professor in a totally online class? This is what we hoped to get from the perception survey. We wanted it to inform how we train faculty. At Hostos, I, I've been at Hostos for 10 years. Ever since I've been there, there is an online initiative where faculty have a mentor, and they sit and work with that mentor as they create their shell for their future online course. So we wanted to know, were we doing it right? What else could we bring to the table? We also needed backup. Every time, if we found out that the students didn't have enough access, we'd be looking for funds to add computers somewhere. If we needed stronger Wi-Fi in different areas of our building, or if we needed to um, train advisors, we might need money for that. Uh, we also needed to share this information with the students. We wanted to make sure 
that students' learning experiences and increasing the college's profile as an innovator in this community, of which you're all members since you're here, stayed forefront in our work. We have shared our results multiple places, among them Center for Teaching and Learning at Hostos, We Train the Future uh, Online Instructors. We've presented at the Q Conference, CUNY IT, and in Puerto Rico at the HETS Conference, Hispanic Educational Technology Services, for those of you that are not familiar. An excellent organization, I'll give it a little plug. We've also published a two-part series, or well, right now it's a two-part series, we hope to expand it. The first one looked at our initial results and analysis. The second one compared one set with the other, and we found that most of the answers were, most of the responses were consistent. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Professor Wolf. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about something that developed out of OLA and our Educational Technology Leadership Council. Uh, I'm the chair of that committee currently. And um, in 2017, Professor Kate Lyons from the library and myself and Carlos Guevara from the Educational Technology Department <coughs> all began working on this idea that, hey, we should publish a book. And we decided to write a book about ed tech and about um, the decade since Carlos took over as the director and what has happened since then in terms of how the how much innovation we've had at Hostos. Um, so it's an edited book with a lot of contributing authors. Every time I think about the number, I keep getting it wrong, so I'm not going to give you a number. Um, Professor Kate Lyons in the library, Carlos Guevara and myself are the editors of the entire book, and uh, we have also written chapters for the book. Um, the book is called Developing Educational Technology in an Urban Community College. Uh, we were very excited because, let's, can I, let's see if the link will work. Oh no, it didn't work. Well, uh, sorry, my, I'm not a morning person either, so I'm just like, really? <clears throat> There's our book. Yay. Uh, this is my first experience ever trying to write a book. You know, as psychologists, usually it's journal articles that we write and, and not, not books, really. Uh, my colleague, who's a historian, he knows more about writing books than I do. Uh, but we were very excited to see the pages up at Paul Grave website that we have an ISBN number and you can buy it. It's not out yet. It'll be out in August 2019. But it's just you know really cool to see our efforts over the past two years come to fruition. Um, now I got out of where it was at, right? Um, I think the little PowerPoint icon at the bottom. To your right. There, there we go. Sorry, they're not big enough for me. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay, so you know we're just very excited to see that, and I wanted to share that with as many people as I can. So it's just really cool. Um, so uh, Professor Burrell, um, you've already heard from. He wrote one of the initial chapters about Hostos and the context that Hostos is situated in, uh, and where we fit in terms of CUNY, the South Bronx, um, our students. Um, it was an excellent chapter. Um, Professor DeSanto also contributed to three chapters about online learning, OERs, and we wrote a chapter together about essentially OLA, building community through assessment, and how, how we've done that at Hostos. And then I contributed to several chapters with Carlos Guevara and Kate Lyons. Um, I wrote a chapter about reaching beyond the early innovators and how we do that. Also, uh, connecting the dots, just my personal experience, so it's a narrative, and then the OLA chapter. So. There's a lot of good stuff in this book, and you know, you would think reading about maybe ed tech development over a decade, maybe it's not going to be that interesting, but I think it really is interesting. Um, and we've gotten some great uh, endorsements from people um, lately for the book, and so you know, everything is progressing really nicely. And it's you know, it's really good to see this come out of OLA, come out of the ETLC, the committee, and um, how many people are contributing to it. And, and 
it's just a great project. Uh, but that's all I'm talking about. So I'll turn it over to my colleague. Good morning, everybody. Um, so you have heard my colleagues uh, about their experience here in the last five years. And uh, my role here now would be, uh, as a new member, how uh, to talk about what's my perception of the of the uh, committee, the work that they have been doing, and essentially what uh, what uh, do I see myself in the committee? So, uh, as a newly hired uh, full time faculty, um, one of the requirements obviously was to provide some service to to the college. And uh, in that in that sense, you're advised to be part of a committee um, in the college. And I was looking into into what should be the best choice for me, the most suitable uh, choice for me in terms of a, in terms of a, be part of a committee and start providing that service working for the college beyond beyond the teaching. Uh, so. Obviously, I ended in, in OLA for two specific reasons. I had been there in my period before being a full-time uh, um, instructor. I, uh, uh, as an adjunct, I was creating, I was involved in creating my classes as a hybrid, as hybrid courses. So both of my classes were a hybrid course. So I already had some kind of connection with people from EdTech and with these um, with these tags. And, and the other reason why I also became part of the committee is because two of my colleagues, um, Chris and Kate, they were both in, in the same, or the three of us in the same department. So there was kind of a connection there, logic transition for me, how to get into the OLA committee. But besides my interest in working in, in doing, uh, in figuring out the uh, technological uh, uh, I don't know, use in terms of uh, using technology in the class and how it works out. So uh, right now, being my first semester as member of the of the OLA committee, I, I have been trying to get to know what's happening. As you heard, they have done pretty, uh, um, quite a, a, an amazing job during the last five years and a lot of work that right now I'm trying to get to know what they have been doing, what's the research, what surveys have been, uh, they have been uh, going on to, what kind of work do they do. So I'm, I'm still testing the waters there in terms of becoming myself uh, more uh, useful. Um, so what one of the things that in terms of how useful could I be as well as a, I observe where is a committee heading towards. So after the five years and the publication of the research that they have done, um, so where do, does the committee see uh, itself in moving forward? And in that case, um, they didn't mention that there, there are a couple of co uh, members of the committee that they have to step out because they are going to, uh, they are taking other important tasks. So suddenly we have found the, uh, the that the committee need more members. Uh, in my case, I approach myself to the committee, and that's that's where we are debating right now. Uh, what would be the most suitable and ef uh, effective way or uh, towards our committee in order to improve the work that they have done and move forward? So we have a dilemma whether do we have to let it be the same way I, I became part of the committee, just uh, approaching, approaching because of my interest, or do we have to be a little more proactive and, and try to look around in, in different departments uh, and to try to have an idea which person which professor would be more suitable and perhaps interested because they have developed i don't know a, any um teaching online ex they have a teaching online experience so that's the idea that uh, that we are debating that we are right now thinking as well as two more two more uh, 
questions about where we heading in, in the future. So what do we want to do with data? Until now, the, the members of the committee has, has gathered information from students. So they have, we have been discussing that it is now probably the, the time to try to match that information with data from their professors as well, from those who teach on a hybrid and asynchronous classes so that's a that's the way in which we are heading right now towards creating a new faculty survey to have to to see the perspective from the other side so how do professors feel how comfortable they feel how do they uh see the the, the students etc and obviously broadening the 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 uh the scope of how do we present that information that we are collecting both as it has been said before in terms of publications and and conferences at different at different levels and with that i uh, i want to leave it here and in case that that uh, we want some i don't know any questions and uh, should i stay here I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. if anyone has any questions or or comments for any of us we are happy to to have a dialogue yes um, I'm interested in the assessment and uh, outcomes of uh, the online courses. Uh, I'm not quite sure I phrase this question. But my question is, um, in your hybrid and online classes, um, do you find that it's uh, easy to collect assessment data? And if so, what are the outcomes? What have you found uh, is beneficial uh, in your hybrid and online courses in terms of assessment? Yeah, we've we've uh, we've run into some difficulties in collecting data f about student perceptions, largely because the way that we formed the protocol in the beginning, we rely very heavily on faculty to encourage their students to fill out the survey, and so it requires a lot of buy-in on the part of faculty to be willing to push the survey, not to make students fill it out, but to just keep reminding students that you know, this research is being conducted and that it would be very helpful if they would consider doing that. Uh, and so that has been a, a little bit of, a, of an obstacle at times. Um, yeah. If I can clarify, I'm sorry. Okay. That was a great answer to uh, student perception, collecting yeah. data assessment about student perception. But I meant the actual, um, like the assignments and tracking uh, student performance. Are you using uh, that as well? We haven't collected, uh, our committee hasn't collected uh, data specifically on that. Um, but we are, as a committee, looking at ways that we can get more varied information from the institutional research department um, to look at things like um, the correlation between GPA and online um, course participation and, and things like that. One of the very important initiatives that OLA has been involved in assessing is um, student readiness for online, uh, for participation in online courses. Um, the education department developed an online um, module called Are You Ready? Um, that has really helped to give students the, the opportunity to see whether or not their learning styles fit with online courses and also giving them the tools necessary so that they would be able to effectively navigate um, online and hybrid courses. But our committee hasn't specifically been involved with assignments. Thank you. If I may, if you're interested in the uh, results of our assessment in the two cohorts that was the foundation for our article, the articles are listed up there. They're both published by X.org. Uh, um, I can just add a okay. little bit to that. Um, at Hostos, the way faculty do assessment of their courses in terms of the student learning outcomes is uh, an individualized thing. Every faculty member may do it in their own way. We do have a software, the Office of Academic Affairs, and encourages faculty to use to put their data information up there so they can tell how students are doing in terms of Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but it's every department is different, and, and every course is different, even in the department in terms of how they do assessment. Thank you. Thank you.
uh, and we're still in kind of the initial phases of getting used to that. Yes, please. For someone who's in your position, I, I was really interested by the fact that you're all faculty and you're all taking this on as a secretary and director. Um, I wanted to know what kinds of help you either are receiving from other parts or, or collaboration that you are receiving from other parts of the institution, or that you wish you were. <laughs> so it sounds like, for example, maybe something to help address the sort of questions that you were asking. You mentioned trying to work with IR, mm -hmm. um, but I was wondering if there were any other collaborations that you wish you could get people to maybe implement on. Well, I'll say, even though we're all faculty presenting here, from the very beginning, FOLA has been a combination and collaboration between faculty and the Educational Technology Department. So there are three members of the Educational Technology Department that have been part of our committee from the very beginning. Um, and they continue to be, including the director, Carlos Guevara. So it was really uh, envisioned from EdTech and they've been able to get buy-in from us, the faculty, um, uh, from the beginning because we had all developed hybrid or online courses um, through their initiative. Um, and then because of our continued willingness to engage with the department, we were recruited initially to be part of this initiative. So it's always been a collaborative thing. Um, and um, the Carlos, along with um, Kate Lyons and, 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 and Kate Wolf, uh, have been working with the Office of Academic Affairs from the beginning in order to get more resources for us um, over the years. So increasingly since 2015, every year we have been getting more and more assistance uh, from the college as we've continued to demonstrate that we are producing tangible, you know, work um, that, that can benefit the, the, the college and the students. Also in our campus, we have a culture of intermingling in the faculty with ed tech, with ed TLC, with the library. It's not an unusual practice to see representatives from all of those entities at the same table. Yeah, well, it couldn't be good without ed tech. You know, yeah. the, the, the to what we do. And they're great. They support us in every way. They help us with the survey, linking the informed consent to the survey, you know, doing some of the technical stuff that we may not be good at doing. And uh, they just give us so much support. We couldn't do it without them. I will and say, they, and they can oh, get sorry. more funding for their activities. I mean, they right. hired a new online learning coordinator. Right. And they're bringing more people in to staff their office for like later hours to faculty. So I think by showing what we're doing and how we are, that helps make the case for Yeah, absolutely. We're, yeah, we're coming up. We're coming up on that. Yeah, coming up on that now. I'm sure that will help you to sort of notice it by people who may not have noticed in your conversation. I'm used to now co chair of the real estate I'm leaving all of that because of that. You're probably right about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for Thanks. Thank you.